I'm going to go over three things you got to get about conservative forces in order to do these problems in energy conservation correctly. The first thing you got to get is that the work done by a conservative force is path independent. What does that mean? Consider an XY coordinate system with an object in it that's going to move between two points, A and B. Now this object can get from point A to point B along any given path in this region. It might take this circuitous route, or this one, or this one. The object moves from point A to point B under the influence of some kind of force, and the work done by that force is the integral from A to B of that force dotted the path. DL is an element that follows the path all the way from point A to point B. This integral will be the same regardless of whether you follow path 1, path 2, or path 3, and that's path independence. For example, gravitation is a conservative force. Suppose there's a hill, and at the bottom of the hill, there's an object of mass m, and the hill has a height h, and I want to get the object from the bottom of the hill to the top of the hill. I'll show you three ways that object might proceed. You might kick it. It kicks like a football. It must be a football. You might kick it really hard. Or you might roll it like a bowling ball up the hill. In all three cases, the work done by gravity is minus mg, the force of gravity in the down direction, h, the displacement in the up direction. And that work is the same for path 1, for path 2, and for path 3. It is path independent. That work done also indicates the change in potential energy. MGH is the final potential energy. Zero is the initial. Minus the change in gravitational potential energy is the work that was done. And that is the second characteristic of a conservative force, that it has an associated potential energy. The work done by a conservative force is minus the change in that potential energy. This fits into the statement of energy conservation. We have an initial potential energy, an initial kinetic energy, a final potential energy, and a final kinetic energy. That's not the complete statement because you also need to add work on the left-hand side, but not any work. The work done by gravity doesn't go in that W. Only the work done by non-conservative forces fits into that statement. Or rather, the work done by non-conservative forces is the change in potential energy plus the change in kinetic energy. Only include non-conservative forces in this work because conservative forces already have a job to do in this statement of energy conservation. The job of conservative forces is to shift energy between kinetic and potential. The work done by conservative forces is minus the change in potential energy. It's also, I'll put in parentheses, the change in kinetic energy if there's no non-conservative work. Otherwise, continuing the parentheses, the change in kinetic energy is the sum of the two. That's the work energy theorem. There aren't a lot of conservative forces in nature. In classical physics, I usually just talk about these three, gravity, electrostatic, and in the case that an electrostatic charge is moving, there's a magnetic force, elastic, otherwise a restoring force. If you have a linear restoring force, it's conservative, and non-conservative forces include friction. And there's only one way to find the work done by a non-conservative force, and that's to integrate the force, so in the case of friction, the force of friction over a path. There's drag, which is basically friction with molecules. There's tension, such as tying a rope to something and pulling it or pushing it. Tension and pushing are injecting or removing energy from a system that's non-conservative. This is the only way to calculate the work done by a non-conservative force. But work done by a conservative force can be calculated using the fundamental theorem of calculus. which says that the integral over a path from point A to point B, the start and end points of the path, of a derivative is the values. 
of the function at the endpoints. The fundamental theorem of calculus articulates path independence. On the context of physics, this F is either a potential or a potential energy. And those aren't the same thing. Let me illustrate that with another table. I'll make a column for the derivative, df by dx, which is the argument of that integral. I'm going to put a minus sign in there, a column for what f is. If df by dx with a minus sign is a conservative force, then f is potential energy. Looking at the integral in the fundamental theorem, if df by dx with a minus sign is force, so df by dx is minus force, integrated from point A to point B, we'll just think one dimensionally here, dx, that equals F, which is apparently potential energy, at the endpoints. Rearrange that and say that force is minus the gradient of potential energy. If dF by dx with a minus sign is a field, such as the electric field or gravitational field, then F is potential usually depicted with a V, and that proves itself quite useful in electrostatics, where V in fact is volts. Referring then to the fundamental theorem above, we're saying the integral of df by dx, which is a field, dx, again just working one-dimensionally here, is f, where f is voltage, potential, commonly referred to as the potential difference. You can likewise rearrange that to say then that the electric field is minus the gradient of electric potential, another expression you're well aware of from electrostatics. This illustration then gives rise to the third thing you gotta know about conservative forces, and that is that conservative force is the derivative of minus potential energy. Likewise, you could say that non-conservative force is not the derivative of minus u. And those are the three things you got to get about conservative forces. And next time, I'll talk about the role that the fundamental theorem of calculus has played in the development of Maxwell's equations.